Calvary, we wanted to kick off this podcast by first saying welcome, but second, by saying this is a longer form conversation than our previous podcasts have been. And honestly, the reason is because it is just so potent that we didn't want to cut anything. We wanted you to be able to hear all of it. Yeah, Jonathan and I, as we're talking with our guests, uh, we're really struggling to actually like keep our composure with how powerful this story is. So we wanted you to experience all of that. So we hope you watch at all. Yeah. And so you're going to hear a conversation that centers around grief and that talks about how Tony and Susan have, uh, how they process losing their 15 year old son and how they process their faith, how they process their grief and how you and I can do that in a God honoring way. And even we get into questions like, uh, what do you say? And what do you not say to somebody else who is grieving? We really hope that this encourages and builds up your faith today. Welcome. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, today, we have two very special guests who are going to be joining uh, us as hosts. My name is uh, Jonathan Sigmund. I serve as one of the pastors here, and I've got my buddy, Stephen Nichols, who Welcome, will guys. also be co-hosting with me. And I'm excited to introduce our guests. But uh, before I do, I just uh, want to let you know the heart of what we're doing here and really, the, the vision of our podcast is to be a place where you can view your life and the things that you are going through through a biblical lens and to have real and honest conversations centering around this. And today, we are going to be talking about grief and how to process that well, um, how to process that through a gospel framework. And um, maybe for you, you have gone through it or you are going through it. And to me, uh, our hope is that this will be a very uh, helpful time for you to grow your faith, to grow your trust, and to process your emotions with Jesus. And uh, so uh, today we have brought on two very special people, and I'm excited to introduce them to you. Their names are Tony and Susan Martirana. How you guys doing? Hi. Yeah, Welcome good. to you guys. Thank very excited you. to have you here. Uh, and if you guys could just start by just telling us just a, a real brief about you, maybe about your family, work history, whatever, whatever you would like to share, the floor is yours. I'd, I'd love to have you share. Okay, um, I'm Susan, and my story um, is I grew up in Long Island. I'm the oldest of four children, and um, we went into the ministry in 1978. Um, uh, Tony became a youth pastor then, and while we were there, we had three kids, and then we moved up to, uh, Tony was invited to come to Elam, and he worked there as a youth director and then we had our daughter, Melody, and there. And then we stayed there for a while. And then we went to North Charlie Community Church. And we have four kids. And we were on staff at North Charlie Community from 92 to 97. We were there and uh, really enjoyed it. And we are married 50 years this oh, year. Wow. Which is so, so strange. Cool. What's the Feels date? What's the, uh, the anniversary November date? 23rd. Wow. Amazing. That's incredible. 24, Amazing. yeah. Amazing. What a legacy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we've had quite a journey. Really have enjoyed all of our years in the ministry. Loving retirement, too. Um, but that's about it. That's great. Yeah. That's great. We've come to Calvary about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I uh, made the journey here. After I retired, I retired at 70, and eight years later, we found ourselves here. And uh, our children, uh, our two oldest, go here uh, with their families. So it's a, we need a big row. <laughs> we, we need a big row. How many grandkids again do you guys have? We have 10. Yeah. yeah. Six boys, six boys and four girls. Wow. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And they keep us busy. Yes, yeah, do. we do a lot of that babysitting and driving the teenagers around. And basketball and football, <laughs> baseball. 
volleyball and soccer <laughs> you just named all the sports actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible I, yeah i love seeing you guys come into church i love seeing you guys and your families and your grandkids come in and just the deep sense of family you guys Thanks. have it, it's yeah. been awesome incredible Thanks. um you guys both have some pretty incredible stories of faith even too of of how you've come to know jesus and um yeah what that was like um so yeah i'd love to can you share a little bit briefly both whether individually or together um how did you come to know who Jesus is? What did that journey look like for, for both of you guys? Uh, well, when we got married, Tony had already been walking with the Lord for two years. I had come from a non-Christian home. My, my parents were divorced. Both of them were alcoholics, so mm. there really wasn't any church in my life. But I was very intrigued by him. I really loved the living Bible that he would read at the time mm -hmm. and um, I loved listening to him talk to other people, and I just became very interested in the whole process of who, who the Lord is and mm. how did that become part of my life. But the first two years that we were married, he was an entertainer, so we were, he was a lead singer in a, in a show band, so we traveled all over the country for the first two years. So we really, I really didn't get my roots anywhere. But then when we settled down, we went to Long I'm from Long Island. We went to a Catholic charismatic prayer group, which was <laughs> wow. all that Tony had known. Yeah. Um, so we went there and I did the life in the spirit class. And then you um, learn all about the Lord and the Bible and all of that at that time. And I took the class and then at the end they pray over you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so it was great. I absolutely loved it. I hmm. didn't have any issues with, you know, I had a lot of baggage coming into my marriage yeah. with stuff, but I really didn't have any issues of, of um, understanding the Lord. Um, the father heart of it took a long time, yeah. but that part of it was great. And then we ended up going to a church that was a charismatic church, a big church, and that's where I took all my classes and was mentored by lots of ladies in the church that were older than me and all these Italian Catholics were coming out of the you know Catholic Church into these churches, and they were just a lot of fun. And That's they cool. were just great people. So That's awesome. Yeah. How about for you, Tony? Tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Um, well, I grew up uh, Roman Catholic and uh, uh, Roman Catholic high school, college, and grammar school. And uh, I, I, uh, I always loved the presence of the Lord. Mm. I would, because I just loved being around the priest or the, the nuns or just church life. And uh, w when I, uh, I went after college, my, uh, my, my father got sick and uh, he told me to go, uh, it would be good to go in the army and get uh, the veterans for co college money, you know, that he, he was sick, he got Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. so, he couldn't afford to send me to school, so he told me go in the army and you become a man. And I and I went in the army, and kind of looked around to how could I become a man, and got all the wrong advice mm. uh, from wine, women, and song and fighting, all kinds of craziness, and that that led me uh, out of the army. I be, I was uh, a bit of a mafia kind of guy. Mm. And, well, he uh, became a semi-pro boxer in yeah. the army. Wow! Yeah. You, you you lived seventeen <laughs> lives yeah, in one did. life. I did. Wow! When I got out of the army, I, I was I was going down the wrong path. My friends, I used to hang around with these uh, great group of guys, big group of guys, and we go into a nightclub, and there'd be maybe twenty five of us and twenty five girls following us, and we'd throw fifty dollars on the bar, and I mean. We would make the bar happen, you know. Well, one night they invited. They said we're going to put Tony up to sing, so they they kind of dared me to go sing. I, I went up, and I sang a song, the only so song I knew, <laughs> and the place went, went went into an uproar. But it was all my twenty five friends with the twenty five girls, <laughs> and the guy, the owner, thought, "Whoa, he was a smart guy." He said he thought to himself, "If I could get this guy here every weekend." And these people come, I'm in good shape. Mm -hmm. So he comes up to me and he hires me that night. He says, Go learn a couple of songs, I'll feature <laughs> you, feature you. 
So he featured me, and I was I sang every Saturday night. They would stop the show, and I'd go up there and sing a few songs, and it, it all of a sudden I became a hit. I I got into Sixteen magazine. I, people from New York City came and got uh, my uh, management contract, and my career took off. And it, when it, it took off, I Tony Matarana got lost. Mm. My stage name was Tony Matty. I became uh, with women and drinking and dope and all of everything that comes with. Uh, and I did that for a, a good eight years. And finally got, uh, I was down in Florida and I was in a hotel room and I got out of the hotel room and I went looking for a girl. And I went on the beach and I, I went on the beach and I, I, I was trying to influence this girl and uh, she wasn't buying any of it. I, I thought, wow, these are good Bronx, New York lines that I'm giving this girl. <laughs> and she's not buying anything. And eventually, she, I told her who I was. and I was in 16 Magazine. Nothing impressed her. She turned to me and said, Tony, why don't you slow your life down and let Jesus Christ lead you to good friends? Mm. You need good friends. <laughs> now, I had people all over the country who were my... my uh, Fans, so to speak, but nobody knew Tony Matarana. Hmm. So Tony Matarana was empty; he was al alone. And this girl, through Christ, hit me in the core of my wow. heart, and I was like stuttering on the beach, saying, "What did you just say?" And she said, "I said, slow your life down, let Jesus Christ lead you to good friends." And I said to her, "Can you help me?" Hmm. I mean, I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. She took me to a blanket, and there were kids playing guitars and with Bibles open to read. I thought they were on dope. I, I, <laughs> I said, what are you smoking? What, what are you into? And they, they started sharing about Jesus. I went down there every day, and eventually they led me into the ocean at night in Fort Lauderdale, and I was baptized, came up filled with the Spirit of God. Wow. And I was ruined for Christ ever since then. Wow. That, that moment changed my life totally. I left show business. Uh, I stayed away from shows, show business for a couple of years. Then I went back in. The first night I went back into show business, I met Susan. Wow. Mm. And the Lord gave me a wife, and then we traveled all over the place. But uh, I left show business in 77. I, I became a youth pastor of a church that was thriving. I had a youth group that grew to 300 kids. And phew, I was, you know, just, uh, I, I, I knew that I was called to be a pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And so then for you, you're on fire for God and, you know, then you, you end up pastoring for many, many, many years in a lot of different locations. You shared some of them. Um, I know you've ended up at New Jersey. Like you, you went to a lot of different places where God called you and led you uh, to downtown Rochester, to Joy Community Church. And uh, really just, uh, you've shared with me some just incredible stories of faith. And uh, hey, if you're at Calvary Assembly and you see these two, Ask them, ask them to share just a story or two uh, from their journey because you will be both astonished and encouraged in your faith. Um, but I actually want to lean into for a moment um, some of the hard times that you guys went to, went through in your life, and, and specifically the hardest instance and moment of your life. And I know it's very personal, it's very painful. Um, and so I, I appreciate that you guys are willing yeah. to talk about the, the hardest thing that you guys have gone through. Um, so if you give just a, a brief context of it um, and then what happened, um, I think that'd be helpful for us to know. When we were at Elam, Tony was part of the singles ministry and used to travel all over the country with um, a team of people. And at that time, my kids were 15, 13, 8, and 6. And our 15-year-old started acting up. We, he went from being an A student and cutting classes to being a big brother at HFL and then started doing a lot of things wrong. He was on a basketball player, and he, would, he um, twisted his ankles so he wasn't playing. And then he just, just started changing. And um, <clears throat> one day while I was at work at Elam, they 
my mother-in-law would live with us at the time, and she called to tell me that James just took the car. Mm. Well, James was 15. We were teaching him how to drive, but he didn't have a license yet. And so I called Tony immediately, and we went to the high school because we figured that's where he was. He was home because of his ankles. He couldn't walk around in school. And we saw him pass us on the road, and we turned our car around and went to find him. And when we found him, he had smashed his car, our car, into a used car lot right on 15. And uh, he was, he was uh, unconscious. And we immediately, you know, went to the, to, to, he was out cold, but he was okay. He looked okay. Yeah. Um, so we ended up at Strong Hospital and he, um, he lived for three days, and then he had so much brain trauma that he passed after three days at wow. 15. So that was a very, very hard journey in faith for us. We were brand new assistant pastors at North Chile, like a month. We had just got there, and this happened in June of 92. So the journey was a long journey of all different levels of walking out our faith, but um, do you have anything you want to add to it before? Well, a truck, a James uh, failed to stop at a stop sign. When we turned around, we weren't turned around to, like, go charging after him. We turned around to follow him home, we thought. Mm -hmm. And then there was a puff of smoke at the end of the road, yeah. and we pulled up to the stop sign, and a truck was in the middle of the road, and, and his car was jammed into a pole, and it, and and... It, it was just an, it was so amazing. I, I got out of my car. I walked across the street. The people in the truck were on the ground. I laid hands on both of them as I walked. And then I went into, the, into my son and sat in the car with him and held him. And I spoke to him about Jesus. In an instant, there were, there were six white-haired ladies mm -hmm. around my car. I, I, I thought I was having a vision because I'm in the middle of like, nowhere what was happening was on the top of the used car lot was a room and they were having a bible study and these ladies came down instantly and were saying around the car is he saved and i said absolutely he's saved just pray for him please and i started talking to james just you know as comforting as i possibly could the interesting thing was when james was born the nurse gave me the baby <coughs> and said, here's your son. And I said, the first thing I said to him was, Jesus loves you, James, hmm. and I'm your dad. It was the last voice he heard, too. Like, James, daddy loves you, and it's okay, you know. And it was, we never thought we would lose him. I had all the faith in the world to pray. I had been on PTL, I had been on TBN, I had done, uh, you know, all these shows. I asked my intern, please go and use my Rolodex and call everybody who's had me praying. And uh, he never woke up. And he was my firstborn. And you guys can imagine it with, with your firstborn. I mean, he... He taught me to be a daddy. And when when I lost him, my faith was rocked to the core. I, I was full-time ministry. Yeah. I was traveling all around the world, went ministering to wounded kids, and here I had a kid that was, he was acting out, and I didn't know it. I didn't know what was going on. When... We went home from the hospital. I was sitting down with the president of Elon, Mike Webster at the time. And my brother came in. He was the last one to see James. He says, he's gone. And I couldn't believe it. I said, what in the world's going on? And my daughter, who was 15, who was 13 at the time, said, Daddy, James drank. And he took the car at night would sneak out and take the car and we couldn't believe what we just heard because he was acting out like a teenager with an alcohol problem 
And we found out later that he did. He was sneaking. This is what took him down so fast. Right. It was only three months he was involved. But it took him down so fast. And teenage alcoholism uh, happens very quickly because they don't sip their drink. They guzzle their drink. And they. And I, I talked to him about it. I said, James, you're going to watch your friends in school. Some of them are going to make some terrible mistakes. I, I sat down and told him, actually at an alcohol convention I, was, I took him to. And he, so he heard about it. But being Susan's mom and dad had alcohol problems, there was a predisposition. Yeah. And I told them about it. I said, you know, you, your friends might be able to touch it, but if you touch it, you, it, you might set yourself on fire. Mm. But he did not. When I heard that, I couldn't believe it. And Mike Webster, the president of Ilum, went out with James the night before because they, James was intelligent, very intelligent look you right in the eye. I mean, he was, he was a man, strong young man. And he went with Mike Webster, and they went out looking at electronics back, at, back then, the, the big thing. And Mike Webster turned to me and he said, James told me last night that drinking is scaring the hell out of him. Mm -hmm. He never told me, mm -hmm. never told us until it was too late. He, yeah. he kept the secret, and he held it, and... Like I said, my faith, my faith was so rocked because I, I thought, well, I don't have an, I didn't have enough faith mm. to bring him back. Mm. How did uh, I have to imagine, I, as, as as I only can, uh, to be in that situation, uh, to to like you said, to have your son and say that you know. Uh, Jesus loves you, and I'm your dad. That that first moment of that parenting, and then um, to lose that relationship, to lose somebody that you love more than anything, uh, and at the same time serving and loving a God who who you believe loves that son probably more than you do. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't imagine holding both of those things in tension, believing that God loves him that much but then still having God allow him to be taken away in that way. I cannot imagine the emotional and spiritual turmoil that would be in. Uh, Susan, I'd love to hear from you. What was that turmoil like? What, what were the emotions that you were walking through, feeling, and, and, and all of that? It took me a long time to get my faith back on track. I kind of went off. I was very angry. I was angry at God. I was angry at Tony because he ministered to children all over the world, but ours was struggling. Um, I knew something was going on at the time, but I couldn't catch him. I kept trying to catch him. I couldn't catch him, but whatever. So I was very, I wrestled with God, you know, why, why, you know, here we are giving you everything. And, I, and yeah. then I came to the conclusion of it. We're not any different than anybody else. You know, it, it isn't that, you know, our child should have lived and others shouldn't, you mm. know. So I became very angry for a while, and, and it really rocked my faith. And I, I didn't enjoy going to church. I didn't like worship at all. Worship was really hard. Can you explain that? What, what, what was it about worship that worship, specifically? Worship, just getting up and singing with my hands up and praising the Lord for how wonderful he was. I didn't think he was wonderful at all. Wow. You know, it, it was very, very hard to um, process that. How do I love a God that, that he could have made? He could have turned this around. Mm. I know he took many children out of comas. Mm. I knew people, but why not mine? Mm. So, But I also, on the other hand, knew that here I am sitting in the front row of the church and crying, walking out of worship most of the time. It took months for me to not be in the bathroom or be in my car. And then I would sit in church, and finally, as time went on, I began to gain that back again. I also had three children. Joy was 13. Joy was at a very crucial age, and she sat in that front row. I mean, she, was, she became a worship leader, but she sat in that front row with her arms crossed, and she wasn't having any part of it. Yeah. 
She was so, mad at me because I couldn't, fi- I didn't fix it. Wow. So we were, I knew that I had to turn things around because of my three children. Mm. But I also knew that I had to learn how to have faith in this crisis. Um, I would tap into the whole childhood thing of the alcoholic parents and, you know, God got me through that. I got out of that. I got married. I had a good home. So I kept tapping into those feelings, even though I didn't know what it was back then. And the Lord just started changing, softening my heart and saying the greatest, the, to me, the greatest was thing was that I was functioning. I was getting up. I didn't want to. Hmm. I was taking care of my children. We were commuting back and forth from Elam to North Chile at that time, and it was a lot of work. Um, but eventually, the Lord, I forgave the Lord. I went to um, some counseling. Never did that before. Went to some counseling. Uh, was was advised to, my, our medical doctors advised us to go to this Compassionate Friends. It's a group for parents who've lost children for the first Christmas. And it was kind of like an AA meeting, you know, like everybody was going around showing the picture of their child and telling all the story of what happened. But these people were like going to the cemetery every single night and putting up Christmas trees on their gravestone. And I was like, oh, my God, shoot me. These people were like five, ten years out. And in my heart, I wanted to find somebody who was on the other side of it that was serving the Lord. Find me those people. And I kept I looked for books, you know, but bibliographies of people who had made it through and gotten on the other side. Those are the people I wanted to talk to. I didn't like these people that were stuck. I didn't want to be stuck. I didn't want to be depressed. It's not my personality to be that way at all. So my faith, my journey just started. I started forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. I had to forgive James, you know, for all the you know frustration that he yeah. caused in the last months of his life. My counselor told me to write a letter. I took the letter and put it in the ground at his gravestone. Wow. And that was a big release for me. Wow. Of, you know, I forgive I had to forgive him for the things that he was doing, you know, to our family. So um, but God just did it. We we walked through it, you know, dragging our feet at times and, and good days and bad James days, we would call them. And we had a wonderful support staff of people at our church that, you know, Susie Jinks would come and sit in the car with me, and we talk about waterproof mascara, and, you know, <laughs> get through all of the difficult stuff. So wow. God yeah. was taught me enduring faith, okay. enduring faith, how uh-huh. to walk through these things, and how to ha- help my children walk through these things. Unbelievable. So. How about how about you, Tony? Well, just to piggyback on what Susan said, enduring faith, you know, in Hebrews 11, it speaks about the champions of faith and how they overcame everything and shut the lion's mouth. And, but in, at, the, at the end of uh, Hebrews 11, it speaks of those that didn't get what they wanted, but their faith was a faith that was even greater, and that was enduring faith. Hmm. Sometimes our faith is tested to the place where we don't see the miracle. We have to endure, mm. and we hold on to Christ. And and for me, when 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 uh, the, my faith was tested, I I looked to the scripture in, in Book of Matthew chapter eight, where it speaks of the apostles going into a storm, and Christ is in the boat with them, and they scream out because they're perishing. Uh, I mean, it's an, a major storm. And I realize I'm in a major storm, and I'm crying out, I'm going down. Hmm. And because I, I didn't think I had faith, so I, I read the scripture, and, it's, and the Lord says, where's your faith hmm. to these men? You're, you're timid. And I felt like, oh, man, I, I was, I'm too timid. I, I didn't have the faith. And then the Lord said, I didn't say the, that they should have the faith to stop the storm, I wanted to let them know that they need the faith to know I'm in the boat. Come on. And I I realized Jesus was in the boat. And I said, I'm going to sit next to you and hold you yeah. because I'm afraid of going down. And I, I said to Bob Mumford, who was this great teacher, Bible teacher, he said to me, how are you doing? I said, Bob, 
I'm embracing the cross, but I have splinters in my mouth. I held on to the cross. I said, Lord, if, you're, if this faith that I, I have can't get me through, if you can't get me through, it's worthless. But I'm going to hold on to this cross until light breaks forth and hope breaks forth. And it took me a couple of years as the father. I kept watching that first girl, and my kids would break down crying. My wife, I couldn't console them when they, they were, it was just, it was in, incredibly sad. But the Lord said to me, teach my people how to grieve. Mm -hmm. Because I was up in the front, and I wanted to bail out. And the Lord said, teach my people how to grieve. And I, we grieved with great health in holding on to Jesus. And one day, about two years into it, I looked down the row, and there was Joy lifting her hands, oh. James lifting his hands, and my little Melody lifting Mark. her hands. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they were, my, my family was, was, was healed. And it was like, God, this is incredible. Hmm. And we took, you know, uh, we took the story. Charisma Magazine asked if we could write a, a, a story on us. They wrote the whole uh, thing on James's passing and our life story. And we were willing to share our hurts. We went to Honey Eye Falls where he went to school, shared with the students there about the, the secret that he held and how he thought that was a good thing. And one of the things also that increased our faith is the doctors at Strong were walking up and down the halls, and one of the doctors came up to us and asked us about organ donation. I was kind of taken back by that, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> the more that I thought about it, he was a healthy athlete, 15-year-old guy, and I thought, you know, this could be God's way of helping other people, and James would want us to do that. So in the midst of that first couple of weeks, um, the doctors... Not weeks, the, the, it was, days, it was we, days. We, when James died, we were home and yeah. waiting for uh, word from the hospital. Right, mm -hmm. and then they called and said that all of... They said, you, we want you to know that there are families all over the country right now getting up off their knees that have been praying for corneas and livers and kidneys and pancreas and you name it. James and loved New York City. Excuse yeah. me. He, he, I used to take him to New York City every year and we'd feed the homeless down the Bowery. And Thanksgiving. With joy yeah. and Thanksgiving. We'd set up tables. And he would say to me, Dad, I want to go to New York. I want to live in New York. I said, James, I, I, I grew up in the Bronx. <laughs> I, I took you out of the Bronx. <laughs> not, not to go to New York. He said, yeah, but I love New York. I want to go to New York. Well, go ahead, Sue. So one of the letters, you can write to all of the people. You're not allowed to meet them. Hmm. I thought it was going to be like a Hallmark movie. You know, I go <laughs> meet the person that had his heart. Well, they don't let you do that. <laughs> so anyway, his they, they got heart, the phone call. We got, uh, yeah, we got the phone call that his heart went to New York City hmm. to a 22-year-old guy who was at Columbia University who had a heart disease his whole life. And he was doing well. That was that was that was yeah. right after uh, Mike Webster told us the, what had happened the night before. Yeah, it was the phone rang. Sylvia Evans picked up the phone, gave me the phone, and this nurse said, "We just want to thank you. Wow, for yeah. all for people are just rejoicing. We know how hard it is for you, but there are people rejoicing, and your son's heart went to New York City. And I felt like the Lord said to me, "I got this." I got this. Hmm. I mean, from peop the six ladies around the car to, to, you know, his heart going to New York City to, to just the way the Lord worked sovereignly. Hmm. It, made our, it made his life count for something every hmm. time something like that happened. Hmm. Yeah. His life was continuing on hmm. through other people and hmm. the we, lives of other, you know, broken families that we'd touch and talk to and... We had yeah, a, a, like a lady in the church who came up to us all excited. She said, Pastor, you have to, you got to hear the story. She says, I went to a, a, a bagel shop in Greece. When I went in, they were all yelling and happy and jumping around. 
And I said, what's going on? She said, my brother, who was on his last leg uh, of kidney failure, just received uh, kidneys from a 15-year-old boy. And, and she says, I, I know that boy. I know the, who the fam that family. And she said, well, it's a miracle because as soon as they attached the kidney, the, the kidney worked. And we had laid hands on my son. The last thing we did said, Lord, everywhere these organs go, let them spring forth life. Sheesh. And it, it was like those kind of things. Another thing, and, and, uh, we went to the neurosurgeon called us after about a, a month. I said, Pastor, you didn't hear anything I had to say when, when you were here, I'm sure about what went on. You come and I'll, I'll tell you what went on with James. We, and when I got there, I said, you know, uh, sir, can, can you tell me if James ever heard me? You know, he goes, you had to be there in the moment. I said to him, I was there. I was right there in the Hearing moment. Hearing is your last sense to go. He said, if you were there in that moment, he heard you. He heard you. And I felt like the Lord had given me that. Because James, I was concerned for James's spiritual, where he was. And when I knew that he heard me, I knew. And then how the Lord worked and showed me. Hmm. I knew hmm. that James was in heaven with, with the Lord. Hmm. It's powerful. Holy cow. Yeah. I'm, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we wanted this conversation to happen is uh, we're doing a, a sermon series on emotionally healthy spirituality and how to process this in a, in a uh, process the emotions that we go through, one of them being grief, in a healthy way, in a biblical way, in a faith based way. Um, can you guys share a little bit about um, you know what were some really healthy ways that you grieved through this, and maybe what were some really unhealthy ways uh, that you grieved through this throughout? I'm sure the years of processing all of this. For me, it was. The unhealthy thing was staying in the question of why. That is what was really, really hard for me. I wanted answers. Mm. I wanted, why? You know, why did this happen? How come we didn't know? I came from an alcoholic home. I know the signs. Mm. You know, why, why, why? And why just keeps you looking backwards. And, uh, you know, I would talk to many people who I really looked up to, mentors, and they said, you don't, you're never going to know why. You're never going to have that answer. So you have to let go of it because it's like looking through the rearview mirror of life and not the windshield, and you can't, you can't live like that. you got to go so, through the rubble. Yeah, take out, go dig through the rubble and find out what the good things are of his life and all that he accomplished and what he did and what his death did. Mm. You know, the 40 kids came to the Lord. We had a service at Elam, and four, the high school bust the kids, and 40 kids got saved. It was the biggest group saved. that Elam ever had. It was a huge, huge, huge funeral. But anyway, that was one of the, the things that was unhealthy. I mean, there's a, there's a moment of it where you have to do it, hmm. but then you have to get out of it, and you hmm. have to go forward. You and can't, you like, stay to, in that why no, question too long. You can't long. sit in it all hmm. the, because yeah. you'll just... I was too afraid of getting stuck in that, and it's not my personality to be down and depressed. And, you know, I wanted to get out of this, you know, fast mm. without coping with anything, you know, drugs or anything. I just wanted to get over this. You know, I, I didn't even know that bargaining was one of the five stages of grief, and I would bargain with God, and I'd say, okay, God, three days a week, I want to go out, and I want to be with people, I want to be normal, I don't want people to feel sorry for me, I don't want to start crying. But two days a week, I'll sit home. And you and I can wrestle through this. And then she called me from the highway and saying, I, I can't even look out the window. Yeah. She was crying. She, yeah. she was crying. Well, we she both go got speeding tickets during this time because we were driving back and forth from Lima to North Chile. And you're just not in the grief. Yeah. You're not paying no. attention. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, I would be dry. I'd be in the Big M in Lima buying food and, and see Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That was his favorite cereal. And I'd be like, okay, I'm done. I can't shop anymore. Bye. I'm leaving yeah. my cart. But that would keep happening until, yeah. and then until finally, you know, my James Day wasn't the same as his James Day. 
you know, and then I'd have to be strong for me and the kids so he could have a James Day, and mm. then I would have a James Day, and uh -huh. he'd be strong for me. And, you know, it was very hard when both of us were in the dumps at the same time. So we kind of learned a rhythm of walking through grief of, okay, I'm going to hold it together today for you and let you have your time. It actually, it, it was the most astounding thing. Y y you know, heartache. I'm talking heartache. Yeah, you I could feel, feel my heart. Your heart feels aching, heavy. Aching. And it was <clears throat> like, it was, it was terrible. Well, you know, you, you say, we, we were selling our house in Lima to move to Chile. And I walked into James's room and his stuff was still there. And I, I just went to the ground and, and I said, Susan, I want to die here. I just want to leave. I don't want to live. And well, he wanted to go to Florida and start a landscaping business <laughs> and forget the ministry. Yeah. That, yeah. that was Makes what we sense. were going to do. Yeah. yeah. But and everybody uh, kept saying, no, no, no. No, stay, <laughs> stay Tony. Put. Stay Tony. It's, it's okay. You're going to be okay. But the grief was, uh, you know, you know uh, Susan was saying, you, you just can't stay in it you gotta keep moving forward and Hel the healthy one of the healthy things to do is to pick a few people that you can cry with mm. that you can tell the same stories about james over and over and over again Good question yeah and be a part of a small group you know being having people support you and stay around you on a regular basis you know let people know his birthday's coming father's day mother's day christmas you know all of those kind of things so yeah building up a support team. But be careful because there are always those people who are going to say, but Susan, you have three other children. Right. Um, thanks. Yeah. There's always yeah. the wrong things to say, but we can talk about that later. Well, no, I actually, <laughs> like, you opened that door, and I'm, I, I'm always nervous, even as a pastor, mm -hmm. or as a friend, as whatever, you know, that I don't want to say the wrong thing. And then I think sometimes what can subconsciously happen for us in those spaces. It's like, well, we try to just like kind of disengage or back away because the last thing I want to do is add hurt to somebody who's already hurting. Mm -hmm. And so it's not even a conscious choice, but it's like, a, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I don't say anything and I don't put myself in that proximity. So what, <laughs> what advice would you give to somebody who sees somebody else, one of their people in their sphere, close or, or peripheral, what, what should they be doing and saying, and what should they not be doing and not be saying? That literally happened to me in Wakeman's. When people would see me, they would like go the other way mm -hmm. because they didn't know what to say. Right. And then I felt sorry for people. You know, I felt sorry for them. Like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to learn how to walk somebody through grief. Come up to me <laughs> and ask me, how are you doing, Susan? Yeah. Are you okay today? Is today a good day or bad day? Yeah. You know, like, ask the we question, used to love don't ignore me. Telling telling us about James that, you know, memories we, after, that they had. We yeah. had kids coming from the high school continually to our home and, and sharing with us about James wow. and the awesome things that he did. I mean, people who got saved because of him and stuff. Just tremendous stories and tremendous heartache stories, too, telling us, uh, you know, what he had in his locker. And, you know, the, he was a little Pied Piper. He kept bringing home all these hurting people. Yeah. But he got c caught up in it. He got caught up. Yeah. He, he was his dad's personality. All charisma, all out there, all people. Yeah. I think it was, it was, that's, that's helpful because I, I, to echo Jonathan, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I should like talk to them about like the, some of the fun memories I've had with this individual oh, yeah. because like I don't know, like, is that, more hurtful to bring those things up to talk about the good times because things have been so bad lately um yeah and it, it just leaves you paralyzed where i would i might even do the same thing where i just turn around in wegmans because i i don't know what to do even if they cry even if you talk to them and they start tearing up give them a hug have empathy just say you know i'm thinking of you praying for you but don't don't walk away don't leave them alone i mean and After everybody, everybody left. left, you know, there were special people that, I mean, Sylvia Evans stayed at her home for 10 days. She canceled every meeting, everything, and she she served, washed the floors. 
I mean, it was just incredible. She would stay up at night when Susan would get up in the middle of the night crying, and Sylvia would be there and read scriptures to her. In the hospital, when James, the 36 hours when James was dying, she stayed up with us and read scriptures throughout the night. Mm-hmm. Incredible. It was, it, he died in June, and September was hard. Kids left. Everybody went to school, and I was alone. I quit my job at Elon because I just couldn't function. And uh, that was hard. And those people were key people. They'd come over with, you know, apples in October for my kids. And those people were the ones that meant a lot to me. Those were the long-lasting, you know, relationships. So um, the other healthy thing that I did is I bought a whole bunch of books on heaven. I wanted to know everything there was to know about heaven. I mean, I kind of knew, but... I wanted stories of people that had died and gone to heaven and come back. And, you know, I wanted to hear all of those stories. And uh, that was really, really helpful reading, you know, those kind of books. Reading for me, I want to fix everything. So for me, it was like, okay, what are the five stages of grief and which one am I in and where am I, how am I going to get to the next one? And, you know, I went to a grief class that they taught, you know, all about that. And I took notes so I could know what was happening to me. I didn't want to feel like I was out there all by myself. I wanted to know what was next and what was next and what was next. And the the you, Lord just showed me. The, the, my kids would say to you today, the adults, that the greatest lessons that mom and dad ever taught them was showing them how to go through the loss of, of a son holding on to their faith. And every one of my kids have been tested in their faith. Yeah. And can by by large things, and they grabbed hold of it and said, "We're gonna we're gonna rock this thing. We're gonna hold on to faith. We're gonna watch this God, God do it." And he has, he has been faithful. All of my kids are saved. All of my grandkids are saved. My family has been saved. And people have come to us and said, "We watched you grieve through this, and it. We want to know the God that you serve." I think uh, one of the things I've been working through and kind of processing a little bit uh, in my own life um, is that I think a lot of times in the church in general, like Big C Capital Church, that there's a ton of focus on the cross of Jesus, the death Mm -hmm. and the burial of Jesus, and, and, you know, rightfully so, of how powerful and significant that moment is. But I think sometimes we don't really know what to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Like how we know that it's like it may, it proved that he was God, but how does that like what does that do practically for our faith uh, in our everyday life? And uh, this might be a very open-ended question, but what hope has the resurrection of Jesus, the life of Jesus and, the, and what he promises and the life after death, uh, what hope has that brought to you guys as you have immensely grieved through something like this? Well, the hope is that, uh, that you know, as a father who lost the son, and hoped for his life eternal, that I could relate to the father who gave his son and how his son, the resurrection of his son, gave hope to my son. And uh, that, that life, the resurrected life, that there'll be a day I see James again. Mm-hmm. And that hope is just an inc- incredible hope. It's not a dark ending. You know, it wasn't a terrible accident. He made a terrible mistake. Mm-hmm. He was thinking totally wrong that he could take the car in broad daylight without a license and just go driving. I mean, he was his his mind was he was he was off on the way he was thinking. But through it all, to be able to know. He's in the hands of the Father, and and the, he has life, as that resurrected life that's promised to all of us, and uh, so th- that encouragement, you know, uh, is just uh, an incredible source of strength. Love that. How about for you, Susan? I think I can, I feel like I can give hope to the people who are going through any kind of grief, mm-hmm. divorce, loss, child, unsaved children. It's increased my hope in understanding 
how to walk with the Lord through enduring faith. And I felt like I could have so much more compassion for people and help them to see on the other side. Mm -hmm. You can get through this on the other side of this. It's, you will see light at the end of the tunnel here. Mm -hmm. And you will see your relationship with the Lord is going to be even deeper and it's going to be even more incredible than it was before. People think that achieving faith is the faith that really is amazing. Everybody wants to see, lay hands on the sick and they be healed. But the, what I, I learned is that enduring faith will teach you much more and take you deeper into the heart of God than achieving faith. Mm -hmm. And it speaks yeah. in the word of God where people who are, saw the miracles and everything, they, they drifted away. But when you endure with Christ the pain and, and the suffering and you see how he works through it. It absolutely uh, builds your faith to the place where you, you can encourage others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good word, Pastor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good words. And uh, yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to both of you guys for the encouragement. You guys have been in my faith and uh, building building me up in my walk and um, yeah, learning and growing, hearing over the last couple of years how God has used you in remarkable ways and how you really have had that enduring faith. It, it inspires me. And uh, I, I do. I just want to thank everybody for listening and for joining. And uh, really, our hope is for you to know God is near to the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. that, that is his word, and it is true. And so if you are in it and you are going through it, God is close to you, and he loves you. I, uh, this, I don't know if this will translate well over a podcast or video, however you're watching this, but I'd love to just pray. Um, Absolutely. And if you are here and you um, are listening, and whether it's the loss of somebody you love or loss of a friend or divorce or end of a relationship or a job, whatever it may be, and you are grieving— um, yeah, I hope that we can just pray uh, for them mm -hmm. uh, in, in their story of faith. So well, let's go to God together. Father, um, may you teach us that the greatest gift and reward that we can ever have is your presence. Lord, for those of us who are grieving, who are hurting, who are screaming in the boat, Lord, I pray that they cling to you with splinters in their mouth as they cling to the cross of Jesus, to the person of Jesus, and learn what it means to be comforted by the Father. We pray that your presence is ever evident. In Jesus' name, amen.